Before I get into it, I just wanted to say that Austrianism and neoclassicism are like overlapping circles or a Venn diagram. And in area one is the quintessentially Austrian stuff where the neoclassicals don't touch. Area three is uh, stuff that Austrians don't touch, uh, mainly uh, indifference curves, things like that. Even supply and demand, there's some debate over that. What I'll be mainly focusing on is area two today where uh, there is an overlap between us and the mainstream. The first uh, issue that I want to discuss with you is rent control. And rent control is very easily conceptualized on a supply and demand analysis as um, a maximum rent level, which leads to shortages. Uh, the powers that be in their knowledge or in their infinite capacity to help people have decided that rents are too high. The rents that would exist in where supply and demand e uh, equal in equilibrium. Not that we ever get there, but we always tend toward there. But those rents are too high, and we have to lower rents to uh, more manageable levels because the poor, whatever. Uh, I'll let me read a, a quote from a Swedish socialist economist, which is a redundancy. Uh, this is Asaw Lindbeck. Next to bombing, rent control is the best way to destroy a city's housing. What I did in a book that I edited called Rent Control Myths and Realities is I got a whole bunch of pictures of rent controlled out cities and bombed out cities. And I uh, illustrated each chapter with one or the other. And, and I didn't say which it was. And in the end, I, uh, in the back of the book, I gave the answer code. I confess I cheated a little bit. I uh, took pictures, I got many pictures of each, and I had to take the least damaging war uh, pictures and the most damaging rent control because, you know, bombing is worse than rent control, but still. <laughs> and, and also, I had to eliminate all pictures with black people or oriental architecture because a lot of them were taken from Japan after World War II and New York City, so that would be a dead giveaway. And I tell you, a couple of months afterward, I would look at these and I couldn't tell them apart. It was really uncanny how bad rent control is. Another Swedish socialist economist who won the Nobel Prize with Hayek, Gunnar Myrdal, said, rent control is the worst exercise of central planning for governments lacking courage and vision. So pretty much economists are united, well, I won't say they're united, but of, of all the issues that differ, distinguish economists one from the other, Rent control is one of the fewest, or the least, uh, distinction between economists. Uh, one reason for rent control is income transfers. The idea is the poor, uh, they're ill-housed, and they need more housing, they need cheaper housing, so if we have rent control, we'll help the poor. Well, this is very inefficient, because it's much more efficient to give gifts in kind uh, uh, rather gifts in money than gifts in kind. For example, suppose I have, have uh, $10,000, and I'm going to give you either $10,000 or a bicycle, a violin, and a year's worth of uh, ice cream. Which would you rather have? Well, obviously the 10000 unless you were going to buy those exact same things and I could sh uh, save your shopping bills or your shopping efforts, because you're probably going to spend that $10,000 i am thinking of giving you if you behave. And so far, I don't see any great... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, the, you'll probably spend it in different ways. So the value to you of these things would be much less to you, especially if you couldn't resell it and you can't resell uh, an apartment. So if you want to help the poor by giving them money, which I certainly don't favor, it's much better and much more efficient to give them money rather than to give them a thing or a thing in kind, like a, a lowered uh, apartment rent. Uh, one example of this is... Is that suppose that the market value of an apartment is 350 and the rent control is 200? It's clear that the landlord loses 150. But what does the tenant gain? Oh, I should have uh, put something over here to hide that, but I'm, I'm a lousy professor. Well, maybe you can't see it. Uh, the gain is somewhere between a dollar and 150. It, in other words, there need not be uh, the landlord loses 150. The tenant could gain 10 bucks if the tenant valued the apartment at. Uh, 210, he would take it at 2, right, and gain only 10, yes? This is a little loose talk because you're not supposed to say value to at, 
In Austrian economics, there's always hierarchies, but just um, for rough, rough uh, estimations to get the point across. Uh, rent control benefits are tied to continued tied to continued occupancy. So if you leave, you lose the value of it, which lowers labor mobility, which lowers productivity. So in New York City, if you have a job uh, somewhere else, uh, say in the Bronx and you're in Brooklyn, you might not take that job because you've got a rent control department in Brooklyn. It would be too much of a trip. So if you don't take the best jobs offered to you, uh, if labor mobility is reduced, productivity is reduced, so rent control hurts there. And then you get these anomalous cases where you get some apartment that could be renting for five or ten thousand a month, and uh, the mark uh, the rent control rent is three hundred a month, and it's occupied by Mia Farrow, who is a very wealthy movie star, Woody Allen ex-wife. So if it's a, if it's supposed to be helping the poor, what is Mia doing in in that apartment? Uh, that's hardly any way to help the poor. And then th there's also another unfairness. Not only do the poor need uh, housing, they also need food and clothing. Uh, but do we make restaurants give the poor cheap food or groceries give the poor cheap food? No. We uh, take it out of general taxes. Not that I'm advocating this. I'm, I'm against, as a libertarian, uh, theft. <laughs> 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 but the point is that if you're going to do it, uh, this is an inefficient way of doing it uh, because, or it's, it's a particularly unfair way of doing it because w why is it the, the burden just on landlords and, and not say if the poor don't have good clothes, make tailors pay them or give them cheap clothing. We don't do it that way. So uh, rent control is sort of anomalous in, in the... Um, in the way that uh, the lefties do things. Okay, other problems. Uh, we get uh, shortages. Uh, look, there's a tendency for profits in all industries to equate. If the profits are very high in one industry and very low in the other industry, the resources go out of the low profit industry and into the high industry until they sort of equilibrate given risk and other complications like that. Well, if what you do is you don't touch any other industry except residential rental units, and you make profits lower there, then resources will leave there. But if you want to help tenants, what you want to do is encourage resources to come in. So you're having the exact opposite effect of what you supposedly want. Namely, you're encouraging resources to leave when you want resources to come in there. Uh, there's d deterioration. Uh, First of all, the landlord has less money with which to make repairs. Secondly, and more importantly, has less incentive because if the rent is way below the market value, his tendency is to try to give you a residential unit that is roughly equivalent to the rent because he has no incentive to give you better. And if the residential rent level is very low, his incentive is to give you a low set of services. So without rent control, landlord-tenant relations are pretty good. In commercial real estate, which has never been controlled, if the tenant wants something, uh, the landlord has got a, every incentive to try to get it to him, so to keep him as a customer. You know, the, the customer is always right. That's maybe too extreme. But the idea is when you have customers, you try to serve them. Uh, recently, uh, with the oversupply of housing in New York City, in the non-rental, uh, non-rent controlled area, Rents have been coming down. Why? Because the, uh, the surplus housing, because of the uh, economic crisis, and uh, landlords are very amenable to try to keep tenants and try to keep tenants happy. When you have uh, rent control, then you have uh, exacerbation. It's as if, suppose we told McDonald's that you can't charge more than 50 cents for a hamburger. Well, you get lousy hamburgers, right? You get a quality hamburger at 50 cents instead of at uh, two bucks or three bucks. And then there'd be a lot of complaints. Well, McDonald's, the bathrooms aren't clean, the, the place is dirty, whatever. And if they follow the rent control pattern, you'd have special McDonald's courts. They have special landlord and tenant courts because there, there was so much um, fighting between landlords and tenants that the ordinary courts couldn't handle it in New York City. Then you have um, the South Bronx, which most of my pictures were taken from, and you get a lot of arson there. What happened is before rent control came in, the houses were insured for a certain level, and then 
uh, when rent control came in, the present discounted capital value of the housing went way down, yes? But the insurance stayed there. And if there was a fire, <laughs> they could get this much. And if there wasn't a fire, they could only get this much. So the landlords had an incentive to set fire to their buildings. The tenants, too, had an incentive to set fire to their buildings because they wanted to go to the new public housing of the day. And there was a long queue to get into public housing. But if your house burned down, you got to the top of the queue. So here, landlords have an incentive to burn, burn, baby, burn. And uh, <laughs> tenants have an incentive to burn, baby, burn. And it's amazing that a lot of houses burn. I, I don't know why. <laughs> it just Maybe it's an accident. But that's why the South Bronx looks like a bombed out place, because a lot of people had an incentive to burn their housing. That, that can't be a rational uh, economic system. Uh, there was no new building whatsoever with rent control. In, when rent control, you see, rent control was put in. The first rent controls in the U.S. were put in in World War One, but they went away in a couple of months. Then rent control started in 1942, late 1941, because of the wartime emergency, so-called. And uh, most cities decontrolled their rent control in 1946 when the war ended. But New York City still has rent control on its books. And you know what the name of the law is? a law to prevent scarcity due to wartime problems. And the war they're talking about is World War II, which ended in 1946, which is, I don't know, 50 years, uh, 60 years ago, over 60 years ago. It's the most amazing thing. I mean, I had a full head of hair before this started. Look at me now. You see, you see the uh, implications of rent control. Well, what happened, uh, there was another complication uh, we have to bring in the zoning, which I'll get to later, but what happened was originally you could build on 60% of any land that you could amass, so you'd have to leave some land for lawns, sidewalks, and corridors, and other things. And then the law was you could only build in 40%, got it? But you had two or three year grace period to get in your foundation. If you could get you in your foundation, you could build on 60% of your land within two or three years. If you couldn't, you could only build on 40% of your land. So everybody and his uncle started building foundations all over the place to get in under the 60% old law. And uh, three or four years later, there was a gigantic surplus of housing or a, a massive amount of housing in New York City because of all this artificial building due to the zoning complication. And uh, the rents were very, very low, as you can imagine. The supply uh, shifts to the right. Demand doesn't change much, uh, so rents are very low. Landlords were offering all sorts of deals. You know, come rent from me, and I'll give you a year's free rent if you sign a three-year lease, things like that. But after that, under the 40% rule, there was just no building. And what they had to do is they had to promise anyone who built new stuff wouldn't be rent controlled, because if you would be under the rent control, people would be a little scared of building. So they promised any new housing. So now you had two sectors of housing. The old sector built before, whenever this was in the 50s, and then the new sector of new stuff. And then what happened, since there was no building ever uh, after this, uh, rent started to rise. And uh, people started to complain. You see, they got in on their artificially low rents. And then after five or six years with no more new building, the rent started rising and landlords were unconscionable. They were greedy, you know, the, the greed index went up or something like that. <laughs> that was a joke. It, it wasn't very funny, but <laughs> <laughs> there's no such thing as a greed index. People are always pretty greedy trying to maximize profits. So uh, the New York City went back on their promise. Their promise was that the new housing wouldn't be rent. No, they didn't really go back on their promise because they promised that it wouldn't be rent controlled. So what they did is they rent stabilized it, which is just another name for rent control, but that would be against the law because they promised not to, so they call it rent stabilization, and somehow that got through, which further messed up New York City housing. Here is a very interesting uh, set of statistics from Harold Demsetz, who was a Chicagoan-type economist from UCLA. And what he did is he uh, took a, a list of Explicit racial advertisements in those days, you could say no blacks allowed or no uh, whatever ethnic group allowed. And he just took an index of the hundreds of column inches of ads that mentioned things like no blacks need apply for a rent unit. And uh, 39, 40, 41, the, the uh, 1,000 column inches, uh, 1,000 and 1,000. 
And then rent control was instituted in 1942, and it started going up and up and up. And by the time the end of the war, it was nine times higher. And then when rent control was eliminated, it started receding. You, you see that? Oh, should I push it up a little? Thanks. Uh, so this is not a definitive proof, but is it because Austrians don't believe in, in proof of this sort. This is an empirical, not evidence, but an illustration of what happens because when there's a gap between supply and demand, when the price is below the equilibrium, you have to ration the scarce goods in some ways. And one way is uh, by racial bias. Another way is, uh, I don't know, uh, young pretty girls get apartments more than other people because landlords can't charge them any, any other way, so they you know, pick and choose in that way. Okay, what else is going on here in rent control land? Okay, now the, the next thing uh, is of interest, and this is a, a very important thing for Austrian economics. Uh, I did a dissertation. My PhD uh, dissertation was on rent control with Gary Becker. He's now at Chicago, but uh, he was at Columbia where I was a student then. And my dissertation took the form of uh, multiple regression analysis where uh, the, uh, the observations with cities, how long did the cities keep their rent control, and... Um, X1 was rent control, namely the more rent control, what, what, what were the dependent variables? The dependent variables were things like vacancy rates or housing deterioration or low quality housing or any indication that rent control would screw up housing. So I had about eight or nine Y variables. And I was trying to correlate them with amount of rent control. And I was holding other things constant like income, north, south, black, white, crime, anything else that could screw up housing other than rent control, I wanted a control for so that that wouldn't impact the correlation. Everyone with me on that? So what I, what I wanted was a positive uh, sign for B, B1, and I wanted statistical significance, and I usually got it. I had like 60 or 70 observations. Different cities decontrolled at different times. And the more they had rent control, the worse their housing was uh, holding everything else constant. But every once in a while, I got the wrong sign. And sometimes I got the wrong sign that was statistically significant, namely showing that rent control is a great thing. You get it? Now, if Gary Becker was, a, was the logical positivist that he says he is, if he believes that this sort of a nonsense can really test uh, praxeological premises such as rent control screws up housing. What he should have said is, oh, I got this genius young boy, Block, he's going to overturn rent control. He shows that rent control is great. Instead, what he said was, Block, you moron. <laughs> <laughs> Go out there and do it again until you get it right. <laughs> because we knew what was right. We knew what the signs we were expecting were. And so what's testing what here? Was my crappy empirical test testing the, 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 uh, the praxeological insight that if you lower rents, you're going to mess things up? No, it was the other way around. Namely, it was the theory that was testing whether I got the econometrics right or not. So this is uh, certainly a point that is not, um, not a neoclassical point. This is a quintessentially Austrian point. Okay, I'm now finished with rent control, and I want to get into a whole bunch of other housing land kind of issues, and what I've got on my agenda are zoning, public housing, urban renewal, eminent domain, agricultural land reserve, farm subsidies, and Henry George. I don't know that I'll get to them all, but I'll take a crack at it. Okay, so the first one is, oh, uh, one more thing on rent control. Why is it so difficult to explain this to the public? Why is it that economists are pretty united uh, they're united on this as much as they are on anything else, and yet we have rent control all over the place, and we still have it in New York City. Well, the New York City thing is you have a higher proportion of tenants than landlords in New York City than anywhere else. Also, uh, you have an inelastic supply curve of, uh, of housing. It takes a long time to build a, a high-rise house, three or four years. So the benefits, so-called benefits, the lower rents are immediately apparent, and everyone says, wow, thank God the government's on the ball, they're lowering rents for us. 
but the bad things don't come about, uh, the deterioration doesn't come about for years later and people don't connect the two. Another is, you know, they're against rent gouging. There's this joke, I've come for the rent, the rent, the rent, and you have the landlord with a sort of a fat belly and a, and a dollar sign on his chest and he's got a whip and a top hat and that's the way, you know, people see landlords, so, you know, landlords are bad. I don't know, when I first did my dissertation, I'd go out and give public speeches, and I was ready to, you know, boogie with anyone who would disagree with anything I was saying, and instead all they would say is, are you a landlord? <laughs> have, you, <laughs> have you ever been a landlord? Do you know any landlords? You know, uh, just ad hominems. Uh, they wouldn't focus on, on the economics of it. And the third uh, reason that I've come up why it's so difficult is because you're now talking about home and hearth, and... Economics can apply to other things, but certainly not to home and hearth, is the idea behind this rejection of the critique of rent control. Okay, the next thing is zoning. Uh, my, my man, my main man on the zoning issue is a guy named Bernie Segan, S-E-I-G-A-N, who is a neoclassical economist, a buddy of mine who's recently deceased. Uh, he uh, talked about Houston. Houston is the most biggest city, a major city that doesn't have any zoning. And yet you don't have, uh, I don't know, cement factories in the downtown, and you don't have uh, uh, filling stations on cul-de-sacs. Uh, namely, you, you have uh, zoning. Houston looks like most other cities in terms of land use place, placements. Uh, the way zoning works is the bureaucrats put up a map on, on the board of the city, and they say, aha, well, we'll put residential housing here, we'll put high-rises there, we'll put commercial here, hotels here. Uh, manufacturing there, whatever. And it's sort of like central planning, only geographically, not economically, right? They're telling people where they can do certain things. Well, you know, just like uh, the uh, socialist calculation debate, they can't plan their way out of a paper bag on that or, or anything else. So they make mistakes, and when they make the mistakes, do they lose money from it? No. They just keep on trucking as goes on with government. You know, I'm from New Orleans, and um, Katrina happened, and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and FEMA between them killed 1,500 people, which is pretty bad. But what really upsets me even more than that, because people make mistakes, people would die in free enterprise too, but what really bugs the hell out of me is that FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers are still in business. Whereas if any private company killed people on so massive a scale, or even a slight scale, they'd be long gone. Well, it's the same with zoners. Zoners are there. That's it. You can't get rid of them whether they do a good job or a bad job. And by a good job, I mean replicating the market, and they can't do that. Well, there is such a thing as marketplace zoning. There are two types. One is implicit. Uh, prices, profits. The reason we don't have filling stations on uh, dead-end streets is because anyone who put a filling station on a dead-end street wouldn't get any customers. What you do is you put a filling station on the corner of two major thoroughfares. Uh, you don't have a cement factory in downtown because uh, uh, cement factories is not a high enough value use uh, to put a cement factory. What you do is you locate the cement factory out in the boonies somewhere where the rents are cheaper. And that's, so the marketplace has its own kind of uh, what I call implicit zoning. And then there's explicit zoning. The market does that too. Uh, how does the market do that? Well, it has condominium associations. Uh, the problem here is you don't want to be neighbors with a guy who paints his house uh, pink and blue polka dots because it'll lower the property values of your house. You want people to have a normal color house or whatever. Well, I used to be a member of a condominium association, and every house had to be the same color. Not only every house had to be the same color, they even had a, a thing. You had to have a picket fence. You couldn't have any other kind of fence. They even had to think about curtains. All the curtains had to be blue, or I forget what the color was. It seemed a little extreme to me, and there are some people who can't distinguish between a condominium association and a town, but the condominium association is voluntary. So it's a big difference between a city which taxes you and a condo association where you have to agree to this sort of explicit zoning. But there's lots of other kinds of zoning. There's the layout of department stores. The people in the marketing department uh, study to death, well, you know, should you put the groceries here and the clothing there, or the clothing here and the groceries there, and which way will you sell more stuff? Well, that's zoning. How about uh, the zoning that occurs in a 
um, what do you call it, a shopping mall. Uh, they, some shopping malls have a rule, you can't have two bookstores, and you can't have uh, a McDonald's and a Burger King. You have to have you know, 25 different kinds of things in the food fair. Well, that's sort of a zoning, and if they do it well, they prosper and make profits and can expand their base of operation. And if they do it poorly, they don't, and other people take over. So you have um, a rational economy in, uh, given this sort of um, uh, private, explicit zoning. Uh, talk about being intrusive. I used to play the violin. I'm sort of what's called a hit violinist. If you hate your neighbor, you hire me to play near his house. <laughs> Very bad, I can squeak, but then I sort of play. And when I was in the orchestra, the conductor, every time I made a mistake, he would sort of tap his uh, baton and say, block you more. I'm, I've been called moron by a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> block you moron, play in time and in tune. But you know what he would tell the wind players? And this is intrusive. Anyone play any wind instrument here? They tell you when to breathe. Can you imagine? Hey, you breathed at the wrong time. We're stopping the whole thing until you get your breathing right. Now, the, the worst slave master never told the slaves when to breathe. <laughs> I mean, you know, as long as they picked their cotton, you know, they were fine. They didn't, you're breathing at the wrong time. There was none of that. But the, the orchestra conductor, you know, ah, oh, breathing wrong. Well, that's intrusive, but the point is that it's voluntary. And there are some people that can't get this distinction down pat, and uh, they should give up their PhDs. <laughs> okay, enough with zoning. Uh, the next thing is uh, public housing. Now, my guru on this is a woman named Jane Jacobs, pretty famous uh, urbanist, I guess you'd call her. Uh, she wrote The Death and Life of Great American Cities and a few other books. She's no libertarian. She favors planning. It's just her whole, her whole oeuvre, her whole, uh, all of her writings were saying, well, the central planners of cities do it wrong. They should do it this way. She never said they shouldn't do it at all, so she's not really a libertarian, but still it was in interesting how she criticized the central planning. For example, in New York City, I'm from there originally, so a lot of my examples come from there. They have Lincoln Center, and Lincoln Center has Alice Tully Hall and a few five or six other um, musical kinds of places. And what she said is they shouldn't have all been put there, they should have been spread around. Well, that's not an attack on central planning per se, it's just an attack on this kind of central planning. But her stuff on um, public housing was very, very good. Uh, what she said, there were two problems with public housing. Well, the problem with, anyone know who the Spinks brothers were? S-P-I-N-K-S? Leon and Michael Spinks, boxers. They won gold medals in the Olympics and one of them was beat by Mike Tyson when Mike Tyson was, when Mike Tyson was Mike Tyson. Look, just because Mike Tyson beat him didn't mean they weren't good boxers. They were very good boxers. They won gold medals in the Olympics and all. They lived in the pruitt Igo Housing Projects in St. Louis. pruitt Igo Housing Project was the biggest housing project in the whole country. It had maybe uh, 50 different buildings of 30, 40, and 50 stories high. I mean, that's a lot of capital investment. And uh, they had to blow it up after about 10 years, and it wasn't ter well, it was government terrorists, uh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, these places became such vertical slums, and uh, there was urine and other stuff in the elevators that didn't work, and there was crime, and it was just a, a big mess. You know, the, the Lord of the Flies, that movie, sort of showed what uh, the 12-year-old boy's idea of an ideal society was. <laughs> Well, public housing is a 17-year-old boy's idea of what an ideal society is. See, what, what the public housing authorities did is they did two very bad things. The first bad thing they did is they said, well, public housing has to be for the poor, so we can only allow poor people in. And if you're in and you're poor and you get above a certain income level, they kick you out. Now, who won't get in the first place, and if he gets in, gets booted out for earning too much income? Two-parent-headed uh, two Households, mother and father, they either don't get in the, there in the first place, or if they get in there, the ones that get booted out because they're earning more money. So who's left? Female-headed households. And the female heads of households were incapable of dealing with the teenage boy gangs who would terrorize everyone and, and treat the place like a sewer, which is you know, a horrible thing for public housing and people who had to live there. So the public housing people 
uh, great economists or great theoreticians, they said, well, if we had to blow up the high-rise public housing, it must be something wrong with high-rises. <laughs> so they now have low-rise public housing. I mean, geniuses that they are. I mean, you know, we have private uh, high-rise things that are fine because, you know, based on profit and loss and people have an incentive to keep them and maintain them, and they don't kick people out for earning too much money. The second thing that Jane Jacobs pointed to correctly, I think, was um, this thing called eyes on the street, eyes on the street. In the normal tenements, which preceded the public housing and the uh, central housing commissioners didn't much like, uh, there was commerce all over the place. If, the, if there was a six-story building, the tenement, on the bottom floor, there'd be a store. And if there was a store, there'd be people coming in and people coming out. And there'd be yentas, Y-E-N-T-A-S, that's a Yiddish word. Old ladies looking down on the street saying, aha, he shouldn't be with him, let's gossip about that. And, and if, if there was any crime, they would call the police. And, you know, it was relatively safe. But the public housing people had a visceral hatred for commerce. They're all a bunch of commies, so they hated commerce. I'm not sure why that works. but <laughs> So the public housing had no commerce there. So if you wanted to get a newspaper or a bottle of milk or something that you forgot, you had to go three miles away to, to get it because these public housing developments were pretty big. So people didn't look down on the street because there wasn't much to look at, and the basketball court was two miles away or half a mile away. So you had a lot of crime because of these two kinds of things, weeding out the clean the, we discovered that uh, if you want to stop teenage male crime, you need adult males there to teach them to be civilized. And if they're not there, and, and public housing isn't the only reason, there's also the welfare system, but I'm not talking about that. But if, if adult men are not there in the community, then the community uh, falls apart. Okay, the next topic I want to address is a um, thing called eminent domain or expropriation. People say, well, if you want to have private roads, and I just have a book out on that, um, you don't have to buy it, although it's a great book, and if you throw it at someone, they're in trouble because it's about that thick, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good weapon, offensive, or no, only defensive, you know, don't use it for, but you know, you don't have to take up karate, you can uh, buy the book and bash people with the book, but it's also on the web, uh, so you can access it for free. Well, one of the objections to private roads is you wouldn't have eminent domain. What is eminent domain? Eminent domain is the seizure of property. Uh, sometimes they'll give you what they think is a fair price for your property, uh, but what they think is a fair price and what you think for a fair price it might be very different. So it's really land theft. I mean, look, uh, suppose a mugger comes up to me and says, um, give me your wallet or I'll shoot you. And he's a philosophical robber, so I'm able to dicker with him and discuss dialogue. And I say, hey, tut, 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 you're... Uh, you're robbing me. He says, oh, not so fast. I'll give you a paper clip in return for your wallet. <laughs> well, you know, he's giving me something, but uh, I don't think it's a fair trade, so I'm, I'm not agreeing to it. Okay, so how would private roads get built if there were no seizure? Now, nowadays people are against eminent domain a little bit because of Kilo. Remember the Kilo case in Connecticut, I think it was, or Maine or somewhere up there? where this woman just had a house and they decided that the, the shopping mall needed more room to get in a better clientele and they just seized her house and it was given to these private people, whereas previously it was only done for public use. Uh, my friend uh, Stefan Kinsella says brilliantly, well, why complain about it? At least it's for private use, better than for government use. <laughs> uh, I, I think he's a brilliant guy. Uh, you'll be seeing him later on in the week. Well, how does it work? The way it works is, suppose I want to build a road from LA to New York City, and D is the best way to go. So what I do is I start buying up land along the D, as in David, route, and somebody comes along, uh, a holdout, and says, sure, I'll sell you my land, uh, you know, that'll be $10 trillion, please. So then I, uh, I have, V have our vase, you've heard that expression? Well, there's this uh, thing called options. What I could do is instead of buying up land along D, the best route, I can uh, buy options. In other words, I, I go to you, your name is Ted. I say, Ted, I'd like to buy your land, and we agree on a price of 100,000, and there, there must be, I don't know, 100,000 different landowners between LA and New York City. So I go to Ted and I say, I want to buy your acreage, and we agree on a price of 
100,000. And I said, well, you know, I'm not sure I want to buy it. I'll just buy an option to buy it. Namely, you agree to sell it to me within one year at a certain price, and I'll give you $1,000. And Ted said, sure, I'm agreeing to the price, so you know, he might or might not want to buy it, but he'll give me uh, 1000 now just for the option to buy it at an agreed-upon price. And I start buying up options. And as soon as I, which are a lot cheaper than buying the land outright, and as soon as I come up with a holdout guy, well, then I, I don't use that route. I go to one of the other routes. There's another one is I, I announce that I want to build a road. And I say, here are the ways, A, a through G. And I ask all the people along that road to get together. And the first one that comes along with enough options, or all the options, so that there's no holdout, then I say, well, I'm going that way. So I let them do the work. But suppose that you have this sort of a situation where there's one guy <laughs> who owns a vertical, you know, sort of like from Ohio to um, Kentucky or something, uh, namely a 500 mile long and maybe a mile wide stretch of land. You get it? And he says, no way. Well, there are ways of even dealing with him. I could say, look, I'll make you a partner. You know, you don't really need that land. Don't be silly. Uh, building a road from here to there is a good thing. I'll give you a 5% interest if you give me your land. But no, no, he's obdurate. He hates capitalism. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't want to do it. So now we get into the issue of ad column. What's the ad colon doctrine? The ad colon doctrine is this thing that if you own a square mile of land, I'm not as good an artist as I could be, but what I've got is a square mile of land, and you own a pyramid shape or a cone shape down to the center of the earth. Do you see what I'm saying? And you also own up into the heavens, right? And the critics of capitalism adhere to the ad column doctrine. Libertarians, in contradistinction, don't take up the ad column doctrine. What we do is homesteading. And nobody ever homesteaded 5,000 miles down. So you don't own that just because it's below your land. And you don't own the skies just because it's above your land. Otherwise, airplanes, every time they went by, would have to put a penny in every time they went over some, <laughs> some farm, right? I mean, so that, that wouldn't work. So if you have this guy here, what you do is you tunnel under, or build over. Build a bridge over him, or tunnel under him. Now, there, there's, I, I've written several articles about this. I think they're in the book where, well, how about he, he could take defensive positions. He could then start tunneling under to obviate me getting through. You get it? He could put sticks down there. <laughs> so if I come across with a stick, he's there first. But think in terms of football. Uh, Doug French used to be a football player. He'll maybe appreciate this. Think of a football where you have to defend a goal line of 500 miles wide or 500 miles north and south. That's the defense. Whereas the offense, how, big, how much space do I need for a road? 60 feet wide? 100 feet wide? Six lanes, whatever it is? In other words, all I have to do is get 100 feet through 500 miles. He's got to defend 500 miles. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And, and if he defends all 500 miles and he only goes 40 feet down, well, I go 50 feet down. So the logic uh, is that you really don't need eminent domain. And my point of doing this is I want to defend the free enterprise system in its in most difficult cases. I mean, rent control is sort of easy. Everyone agrees with that. But this stuff is more, I don't know, macho. Or something like that, right? I mean, like if you can show that you don't even need eminent domain, then certainly you don't need rent control and you know these other kinds of things. Okay, the next problem is what I call the bagel problem. It's sometimes called the donut problem, but donuts are uh, anti-Semitic. Um, <laughs> bagels are where it's at. <laughs> Now, I first got into this when I was doing stuff on abortion and uh, child killing. Uh, I was trying to obviate the uh, person who wants to kill their child and puts their child in the back room 
and just doesn't feed it. You got it? In other words, the libertarians have this axiom of non-aggression. Well, you're not non-aggressing, or rather you're not aggressing against your kid, you're just not feeding him. And you're putting your kid in the back room, and you don't feed him, and he dies in two or three days, and that's it. So here you have death by libertarianism, <laughs> right? Sort of like death by chocolate, but not quite. <laughs> And I didn't much like this, so I had to come up with a way to say that this is improper. And my way of saying it's improper gets back into homesteading on land theory. The idea here behind the bagel is what you do is you homestead the B area and you leave the A area open, the hole in the bagel. And now let's assume that you can't tunnel under or bridge over or you're not, you don't have a helicopter or you're not a good pole vaulter and sort of run over the... B area, which is five miles deep. Well, what you're really doing is you're being guilty of a thing that I call forestalling. Namely, you're claiming control over land that you haven't homesteaded. You haven't touched A, right? And yet you're precluding or forestalling anyone else from getting to A by not allowing a path to go through. And I say, well, you have to allow a path. I have a friend who's a Hasidic rabbi who's an expert in the Talmud, and what he says, the Talmud requires that. That if you homestead in that pattern, the bagel pattern, you have to allow people access. Otherwise, you were guilty of contradicting either the Talmudic or the libertarian thing on, um, on you, you can't control land that you haven't homesteaded, and you haven't homesteaded A. Well, to get back to the, the baby, what you're really doing is keeping other people from homesteading that child. See. With regard to children, you have a right to homestead the child. And how do you homestead, namely be its guardian? By feeding them. And if you're not feeding them, then you're not homesteading. You see, with land, you only have to homestead it once. With a baby, you have to keep feeding them, diapering them and, and all that stuff, right? So if you stop, what you're really doing is you're precluding other people from getting the baby who might want to bring up the baby and be the baby's guardian. So you have... And I, I say it's not a positive obligation, because positive obligations are also anathema to libertarianism. You have an obligation, because if you don't uh, adhere to it, if you don't live up to it, then you're guilty of murder. And your positive obligation is the traditional uh, common law one. If you don't want to take care of your baby, you bring it to the hospital, you bring it to the church, you bring it to uh, somewhere, or you advertise, hey, I no longer want to take care of this baby. And only if no one on the whole earth wants to take care of the baby, then the baby dies. But if there's one person, who Murray used to call it friends of babies, <laughs> you know, an organization that was dedicated to uh, an orphanage, well, you couldn't preclude them from doing it. Okay, so this nasty friend of mine, Stefan Kinsella, says, okay, I've got one for you. How about this? <laughs> Are you going to stop that? And I say, yes, you're still precluding. If this is a thousand miles wide, the only way you can get from C to A, and, and A is unhomesteaded, you're still messing up. And what about, then Stefan Kinsella says, well, what about that? And I say, yes, that too. So I'm being a bit of a constructivist libertarian here. I'm saying that you really can't homestead in that format. So this whole um, objection here, you don't really need a, um, what do you call it, to get under you can't homestead in that format in the first place, would be my libertarian read on that. Namely, you have to homestead in square mile lots or whatever it is. Or if you homestead in that way, that's fine. You just have to allow paths through so that people can get from C to A without having to go 500 miles in one, one way or the other way. OK, what's next? The next thing I want to talk about is The agricultural land reserve, what's going on with the, a bunch of lefty, hippie, environmental types are into this stuff. Uh, you know, they now have this thing that you're not supposed to eat green beans. Where are we? We're now in Auburn. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to eat Alabama green beans. And Alabama beef, whether we produce beef in Alabama or not, you're supposed to buy local and eat local. And you shouldn't be buying uh, beef from Chicago or wherever they've got the beef because it costs more to transport, like they never heard of markets, and you know, if it costs a lot, it'll cost more, and you'll do less of it, and maybe they'll have beef here. In other words, what the market does is it's 
It's rational geographically as well as through time. See, a lot of the Austrian business cycle theory is intratemporal, and a lot of other stuff is intertemporal at the same time, but now we're getting into interspatial or spatial economics or geographical economics. And th there's no argument for not importing stuff from other countries, uh, not um, importing stuff from other states. What they're trying to do is get rid of the market, get rid of exchange, uh, and it's, it's nonsense. So what you have is you have a city surrounded by farmland, and the natural progression of a city that's expanding is to expand into the farmland. And what they do is they knock out the farms and put housing in there. And in most cities, they allow that. But in some cities, they have a thing called the agricultural land reserve. And the agricultural land reserve says, no, 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 you can't build there. It's sort of a form of zoning. You can't build there. So as a result, you'll get things like residential or commercial land might be a million dollars an acre. And right next to it, cheek by jowl, there'll be farmland. And what is farmland work at, worth as farmland? A thousand an acre? Two thousand an acre? Much, much less than land right near a city where the city could expand. You understand what I'm saying? So you can imagine the graft and corruption that comes about because the, the state legislature or the provincial legislature in Canada where they have this has got a lot of pressure to take this little bit of land over here and, and convert it into residential land because if they do, the land goes from 2,000 an acre to a million an acre and there's a lot of money with which to bribe people out of that. But it just shows that we're not maximizing wealth. We're not getting the mostest out of the leastest. We're not allocating resources in a reasonable way. What the people want, as shown by their purchasing decision-making, is to put a house over here. And what the government is saying is, no, 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 uh, this has to be inviolable for farmland because, God forbid, we'll go out of, we'll, we'll run out of farmland. Well, you know, the point is, if you're going to run out of farmland, if we're starting to run out of farmland, what's going to happen to the price of farmland? Go up. And then there'll be incentive to keep it as farmland. So the market does this sort of thing. It's sort of like uh, the Club of Rome is always saying we're going to run out of oil. And what they say is, well, you know, we use X oil and we have proven reserves of 10X, so in 10 years we'll run out of it. And they keep saying it decade after decade. <laughs> they, they just don't get it. That the market has within it the ability to solve these problems by prices going up and down and adjusting. You know, for them, prices are, I don't know, capitalist greed or something like that. <laughs> um, one other point about this road business I, I forgot to mention that there's always the threat to build over in other words if there's a road there you can build over the road have a double decker road I'm reminded in this regard of the um, muckraking book The Octopus where there was a railroad in California which was treating the farmers very very miserably uh, you know, they'd say, well, the price for transporting peas is less than such. So everyone would uh, grow peas, and then when the peas came in, they would triple the price. So I always wondered, well, why didn't the farmers just set up their own competing railroad? And the answer was, well, we didn't have free enterprise. You had to, in order to set up a railroad, you had to get the permission from the California state government. And the California state government was heavily bribed or in the pocket of the railroad. And the last thing that they're going to allow is competition. See, uh, this idea of monopoly, you know, if uh, you have the only railroad and you're a monopolist, well, that's nonsense, and I, I will have a section on that, and I think Tom DiLorenzo spoke on that as well. But the point is, if you have the only railroad in California, up and down the California, the last thing you want is to people to even think about putting in another railroad. Because if, if they do, then the, the capital value of your railroad will be a lot less than if they don't. So even if you're the only one, in other words, to have competition, you don't need competitors. All you need is free entry. All you need is the absence of the government saying, well, you can't build a railroad there without our permission, and we're not giving you our permission. As long as you have free enterprise, you don't need competitors for competition, potential competition. The railroad will, will act in such a way as to not induce people to set up other railroads. They don't want other railroads around. So they're going to act reasonably and responsibly and, you know. Um, okay, the last thing I want to talk about is 
Um, no, I've got two more things. One is um, the farm subsidy problem. Here is the farm subsidy problem. What happens is uh, the government, in its infinite wisdom, uh, decides that the poor farmer isn't making enough money. You know what the proportion of farms were at the beginning of this country in 1776 or 89 or something? It was like 99% of the people worked on the farms, 98%. Uh, why? Be was it a little lower than that? I think it's higher than 90, but somewhere up there, 97, 96%, somewhere way up there. Why? Because we needed all the people just to make food, virtually all of our people, because we didn't have enough recipes, we didn't have human capital enough to produce all the things that we now have. And as the uh, economy progressed, as the country progressed, as we had the rule of law and we had civilization, and yes, there are problems with the U.S., but it's a lot better than many other countries, and it was pretty free for many years, except for you know minor deviations, this and that and the other, but large parts of the economy were free. And as a result, we needed fewer and fewer people to be on the farm. But there are certain states, Illinois, Iowa, where farming is very powerful, and the number of people on the farm was getting less and less because you needed fewer and fewer people to produce the same amount of food. And now we could have other things like computers or wristwatches or uh, TVs or stuff like that. And they had this idea, well, we must present, preserve the family farm. The family farm, Uber Alice. You know, the, the family farm is the backbone of America. We have to protect the family farm. If the family farm uh, falls apart and we have, God forbid, capitalist farms or, you know, commercial farms, you know, we'll all die and, and, and we'll all become atheists or something. I don't know. Uh, we, we must have the family farm. But... People keep leaving the family farm, so what they decided to do is, well, we'll subsidize them. How do we subsidize them? We have minimum prices for food. Well, when you have minimum prices for food, then you have surpluses. Supply is greater than demand, and it costs zillions of dollars to just store the surpluses. And then, as Mises says, whenever you have one intervention, it leads to other interventions. Like, you know, in rent control, they started saying, well, you can't have condominium conversions. You can't convert it to a hotel. They had all sorts of other rules, sort of like you throw a rock in the water and the waves reverberate out. Well, with this, they had farm surpluses, which they would then dump on the Indian or African uh, economies and, and impoverish their farmers and create havoc there. Uh, and what they would do is they would say, okay, we'll give you subsidies, but you have to produce, you have to produce say, on only half your land. Okay, so the farmer said, okay, we'll produce on half our land. And they got more fertilizer in more intensive ways, and they got even more food. So they said, okay, you can only produce on a quarter of your land. I'm, I'm making up these numbers. It's not half a quarter, but less and less land. So our farmers are very productive in, in a very artificial sense. Namely, the market wouldn't require such intensive farming. So you have screw-ups here and there and everywhere with farming and, and surpluses. Uh, the last point I want to touch on very briefly since I'm running out of time is this guy Henry George. He also uh, is part of the land story. Henry George was a pretty good guy. He was a laissez-faire capitalist except for the land question. Murray uh, Rothbard used to have this aphorism, they, everyone specializes in what they're horrible at. Like Milton Friedman was really good on rent control, minimum wage, free trade. Does he ever talk about rent control, minimum wage, free trade? Hardly. What he talks about almost totally is his crappy um, educational voucher system and monetary, where he was horrible. So it's the same with Henry George. Henry George was good on everything except land, and what did he talk about? Land. So for his, his um, view is that we should uh, have 100% tax on land because land entrepreneurship is valueless. He doesn't realize that the person who owns land uh, parcels it out, whether renting or selling or whatever, to the person who pays the most money and who will take care of the land best and then and thus provides a service. In other words, the, 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 you know, there's land, there's labor, there's capital, there's entrepreneurship, and people appreciate labor, they appreciate entrepreneurship, they appreciate uh, the person who lends money and gets interest, but somehow they don't appreciate mere ownership of land. They think it's... Uh, stultifying or it's not productive. But it is productive because it determines who gets to use the land 
you know, every once in a while you'll see a, a store that's empty for six or eight months, and you say, well, you see how, how wasteful capitalism is? Well, the guy is trying to figure out the best way to get money to maximize his profits off of that empty store, and he's doing his best. Look, we have unemployed stores, but right now you people in your rooms have unemployed underwear and unemployed, I don't know, shoes and unemployed toys that you're not now using. So, you know, that shows that capitalism is evil because you guys have got socks in your drawer that you're not wearing now. And you brought eight pair of socks and you're only wearing one, so seven of them are unemployed socks. I mean, it's just sort of silly. Well, I'm out of time. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>